Yes, we'll get started. Good afternoon to everyone in Europe. Good morning to everyone uh, in the Americas. Um, we, uh, we, we have this morning a, um, a, a webinar with some real experts um, uh, to deal, uh, to, to speak about and inform a, a broader public about the situation in Ukraine and the extent to which um, religion is or is not um, uh, part of, 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 of this conflict. Um, we are being hosted today by the, uh, jointly by the Coalition for Religious uh, Equity and Inclusive Development and the Orthodox Christian Study Center at Fordham University. Uh, this is our first official partnership, um, which we're quite excited about, and we're looking forward to many more. My name is George Dimakopoulos. I'm one of the co-founding directors of the center at Fordham, uh, and I will be serving as the moderator today. Um, we have uh, really uh, some world-renowned experts joining us. Um, I'm going to introduce each of them quickly. Um, I'm going to make a few broad observations, and then we're going to let each of them speak uh, for, several, uh, for several minutes with, with some opening comments. Um, you will notice, I think many of you are familiar with Zoom by now, but you, you will know that there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, as you have questions uh, throughout uh, the session, please feel free to type them in. We will do our best to get to as many as possible. We are planning for this uh, to run for about 90 minutes. Um, and of course, uh, there will be um, additional um, conversations in, in the future. Um, the event is being recorded and it will be posted on the YouTube pages for each of the partner organizations. So our panelists this morning in the order in which they will speak, First, we have Art Mandrite, Father Cyril Hovarun, Professor in Ecclesiology, International Relations and Ecumenism at the University College Stockholm. We have Father Deacon Daniel Galadza uh, of the Kiev uh, Arch Eparchy of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, fellow at the Center for Advanced Study um, beyond canon at the University of Regensburg. Um, he will be uh, joining the faculty at the Orientale uh, in Rome in the fall. We have Sergei Shapnin, editor, editor in chief of The Gifts, a magazine of contemporary Christian culture and curator of exhibitions on contemporary Christian art. Joining us in a few minutes, um, he, he, he has many uh, pastoral uh, and clerical responsibilities, but joining us in, his, in a few minutes, will be His Eminence Archbishop Angelos, Coptic Orthodox Archbishop of London and founder and director of the Ref Simi. And we have my good friend, Dr. Maurice Tadros, Professor of Politics and Development at the Institute of Development Studies and the director of CREED. So let me make um, just a pair of quick observations um, before we invite our panelists to speak. Um, because uh, our panelists are better equipped to speak to the specific situation on the ground, both in Ukraine and Russia, let me make a few global observations about the way that we use um, religion um, when we're speaking about uh, or commenting on um, Putin's motivations or the role of the church or what the Ukrainians, Russians are doing, or, or fr frankly, how we talk about it. One point I'd like to make about this is that there is, even though it is absolutely the case that Putin is an, an abuser of religious sentiment and instrumentalizer of religion for political purposes, there is nothing new about that, um, even in the time of war. Um, to my mind, it's a kind of heresy. Um, I know Father Cyril has spoken about this before. It's a rejection of the gospel for worldly gain, for prosperity, for, for selfishness. Um, uh, for evil, frankly. Um, but there isn't anything particularly new. It's horrific, uh, and, and we're seeing just how horrific it, how, just how horrific it is, but it, but it is something that unfortunately has been with us for a long time. 
Um, another observation that I'd like to make, um, one of the things that's really interesting here um, to my mind is the way that other Orthodox jurisdictions, both Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian and beyond the Orthodox world, in, in, including um, the, the Catholic world, the Protestant world and so forth, is the way that they have spoken about the war um, and the way that uh, many, many, especially outside of the Chalcedonian community, have called on um, Patriarch Kirill directly to intervene. Um, as, as we all know, Kirill has not done that. And in fact, he seems with each passing day to be doubling down um, as a parrot of uh, Kremlin propaganda. But one of the things that I think is worth watching uh, as we go forward is as Patriarch Kirill beco becomes more and more unhinged um, from reality and simply continues the Putin line, will the other autocephalous leaders condemn his words, um, if not his personal leadership? What would it actually take for the Patriarch of Serbia or of Antioch or of some of these churches that are really staying on the sidelines? What would it take um, for them to uh, call him out? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I think that this is something um, worth, worth watching. So with that, um, I would like to um, turn it over now to our first speaker, uh, Father Cyril. Right, uh, thank you so much, uh, George, for, for your introduction. I thank you for the organizers of this, um, uh, of this online meeting uh, for a discussion which is uh, timely and uh, I hope it will have a follow-up. Um, George, you probably, you, well, you, marked the main topics, the main issues that need to be addressed uh, in order to, uh, to comprehend what is going on. We are still in the process, the war is still going on, uh, and uh, probably it's too early to reflect on, on it in, in, a, in the proper academic, scholarly, or ecclesial way, um, but it's, it's, it's already a kairos, a kairos to, to do something, to, to start this sort of discussions. Um, and indeed, I believe that, as you, as you indicated, uh, this war has a religious dimension. It, it certainly has a political uh, motivation dressed in, in the religious rhetoric, and it has been so since at least 2014, when the war actually began. Yes, we are talking about the, you know, uh, the war. Everyone talks about the war nowadays, but it is not a new war. <coughs> it's just an escalation, a new phase of the, of the war. Uh, that has been there since uh, 2014. Uh, from 2014 until uh, February uh, 2022, it was what I call the, the slow war, uh, which claimed nevertheless, almost on the everyday basis, human lives uh, in the east of Ukraine. And we have been warning and, and writing about this war since then. Uh, and uh, we've indicated that uh, this war has been underpinned by, by a quasi-religious agenda. It's indeed uh, not about religion per se, it's about the abuses of religion. Uh, that's why I was asked in, in one of the shows interviews uh, whether religion as such should be blamed for the war. I think it, would, it, is, it is a wrong um, uh, approach to it. No, we are dealing with an abuse of religion. Uh, we are dealing with the instrumentalization of religion and weaponization of religion by political forces, which do not subscribe to religion, religion as, such, as such, but they use religion. Uh, to their own ends. And this is certainly the case of Vladimir Putin, even though he claims to be a religious person, I believe he is profoundly secular uh, and he uses religion to his own ends. He has some strange ideas, a mixture of uh, uh, you know, superstitions, uh, so, some kind of metaphysical um, you know, uh, worldview, uh, which needs to be analyzed in more detail in, in due time. Um, and uh, he essentially, he is a manipulator he is uh, an abuser <clears throat> uh, uh, regarding the religion. Unfortunately, the church um, yields to his uh, program, his agenda of abusing religion, corroborates uh, this agenda and uh, uh, is complacent uh, with his agenda and the war as such. Uh, we in the Orthodox world uh, go through a profound crisis. This, I think, no one will, will doubt that. And I would say that this crisis should be understood in the proper Greek uh, sense of the word, uh, crisis, 
um, uh, in Greek means judgment. Uh, we are dealing with a judgment. It's, if you want, it's a doomsday, uh, not just for Ukraine, where we struggle to survive. It is also a doomsday for the Orthodox Church. The Western churches, including the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches, had their own uh, crisis momentum uh, after the World War II, uh, following the collaboration of some significant religious groups in the Western Europe with the Nazi and fascist regime uh, regimes in the in the interwar period and then during the World War II, uh, the, the main uh, Christian denominations in Europe repented uh, uh, about this co collaboration. They changed their mind. That's exactly what the Greek word uh, metania, uh, metanoia, repentance means, changing their mind. And we saw the indication of this change, like in the, of course, in the Barman Declaration of the Protestant Churches, we saw this uh, metanoia in the decisions of the Vatican II, which had its own uh, uh, opportunity to overcome the the crimes and mistakes that the church made during the World War II and before that. The Orthodox churches who had cooperated with the fascist regimes in, the, in that period of time, we had our own small fascist regimes in the Orthodox world, like the, the Serbian, the Romanian, the Greek uh, dictatorships. Uh, we, the Orthodox churches, never repented in what we did. Now, uh, we're much overdue, with much delay, we have this opportunity and we should not miss it. We have to uh, reconsider our positions in the political theology. We should probably, yes, the, what I call the, the deputinization of the Orthodox theology is very much urgent nowadays, and we need to address it as, as, as soon as possible. But as a matter of fact, we need to go even further in the past. We need to reconsider the roots of this putinization that happened in our days. This is new, not a new phenomenon. It's, it's just another, an updated form of, of what we had in the, uh, in, during the 1930s, during the 1940s, during, for instance, the, uh, the dictatorship in Greece in the <clears throat> late 1960s, uh, when the church cooperated, appeased and justified dictatorships, uh, justified the abuse of power in the name of, you know, of the traditional values, in the name of Byzantium, restoration of Byzantium, or whatever excuse they you know, they found to support the, uh, the authoritarian regimes. We see the repetition, the reincarnation of those, what I call totalitarian theologies in our days. We need to address this, um, uh, these theologies. We need to deconstruct, I believe, these theologies in the same way as the, the European theologians, uh, Western theologians had deconstructed their own totalitarian ideologies and theologies. And we need to do this urgently. It's our call. We will do it with a great, with a big delay, of course, but we cannot miss this opportunity. That would be my message. We need the process of deputinization. We need a, a synodal condemnation of, uh, yes, I agree with you, George, with your language of the heresy uh, that we are dealing with, uh, with. I am currently in Constantinople, and I, I believe that the Church of Constantinople needs to take a lead in the process of addressing on the Panorflux level of the issues uh, that we are discussing right now, the totalitarian uh, uh, till in our Orthodox theology, the roots of this till, the, the roots of, of, of this tendency. Uh, I don't know what will be the form of uh, conciliar form of, uh, for condemning um, uh, these ideologies and these totalitarian theologies. They will be traditionally Orthodox, I believe, meaning that they will incur, they will include uh, the, the addressing of, of, uh, of this theology by the councils. Uh, and uh, the last word, the last thing I want, I want to mention, uh, why uh, naming uh, these totalitarian ideologies a, a heresy is not very much an overstretch, it's not very much you know, a symbolic language. Uh, we, should not believe, we should not forget that the nature of the heresy is to create impediment between human beings and God. Uh, and traditionally, the traditional heresies that existed in the past of our church exactly um, uh, provisioned such, uh, such impediments between the human beings and God. What we are dealing with right now with the, with the uh, ideologized theologies or theologized ideologies, you name it, uh, both ways are correct, I think. Uh, we are dealing with the a creation raising idols that substitute the alive and, and, and loving God that we believe in, one God, 
those idols of you know of the traditional values of the civilizations when the civilizations including the greek civilization or russian civilization or any civilization substitute you know the church the uh, theo uh, human unity those are idols that need to be removed that need to be condemned that would be uh, the process of you know catars catharsis uh, through the condemnation of those yes i would dare to say heresies that now um, uh, uh, haunt our orthodox world. We need to address it. It's time, it's feroz. We should not miss it. Thank you. Father Daniel. Yeah, thank you very much, George. It's an uh, honor and a pleasure to be here with you, notwithstanding the horrible circumstances uh, that are going on right now in Ukraine. I'd just like to give a short presentation on not the Orthodox churches, but the Eastern Catholic presence in Ukraine, which has been there for centuries. Um, so uh, there's already been a lot of mention of 1930s and 1940s. So uh, there's an article on public Orthodoxy as well, com comparing a leader from 1930s, Hitler to Putin. You can read about that by Father uh, Paul Gavriluk. For the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, it's one of the 24 Eastern Catholic Churches. It's a global church now, but in 1939, it had 4 million faithful and about 3,000 priests. In 1989, um, on the uh, eve of the collapse, or maybe not, that's arguable if it actually collapsed, the Soviet Union, uh, there were 300 priests, and their average age was in, the late six, in their late 60s. And now we have about... Um, 4,000 priests, 800 seminarians, 36 eparchies and exarchates with a global population of about 5.5 million people. Headed by a major archbishop, the title is contested because he claims to be a patriarch, uh, but Rome doesn't recognize this for various reasons. Um, there are four metropolies in Ukraine, four metropolies in, outside of Ukraine, Poland, America, Canada, and Brazil. Uh, the history of the church is really one of contact between East and West, uh, as evidenced by some of its leaders in the 20th century, Metropolitan Andrzej Szeptycki, who was a member of the Polish nobility and in contact with a lot of the movers and shakers of the Catholic Church before the Second Vatican Council, and Cardinal Joseph Slipi, uh, there's a biography of him uh, presented as a Byzantine Thomist by uh, Yaroslav Pelikan. If you want a more popular rendition of his life, you can watch The Shoes of the Fisherman, by, the book turned into a movie by Morris West, where he's played by Anthony Quinn. Getting to the questions that were presented, and I should actually say that in this time between Metropolitan Andrei Szeptycki and Cardinal Joseph Sleepy, um, the Greek Catholic Church was a church of martyrs, um, hundreds of thousands of faithful uh, deported to Siberia. And this is a fate that's not just unique to the Eastern Catholic churches, but also part of the history of the Orthodox churches in Ukraine. Uh, the difference with the Eastern Catholic churches was that there was, for example, in 1946, a so-called reunion council that liquidated the Greek Catholic churches that was co-organized by the KGB and the Moscow Patriarchate, although to a certain extent unwillingly perhaps, but uh, the Moscow Patriarchate has still not condemned this council, which liquidated and imprisoned and um, deported uh, all uh, Eastern Catholic bishops in Ukraine. Um, and Cardinal Joseph Slipi was in Soviet exile for 17 years. So getting to questions that were posed to me, what is the position of Eastern Rite Catholic community in Ukraine and how does it follow its fellowship challenge the East-West dichotomies? Well, this is basically a, a question of the identity of Eastern Catholic churches. Um, they're presented as churches in between or stolen churches or bridges to unity, perhaps. One articulation of its ecclesiology is Orthodox in communion with Rome, which most Orthodox won't accept and even some Eastern Catholics wouldn't accept. Uh, but generally speaking, it's the same Byzantine liturgical, spiritual, and theological tradition as the Orthodox, for example, in, U in Ukraine, but in communion with Rome. So uh, the question is now being posed even last week, uh, there was a conference at the Angelicum where the Ukrainian Catholic Bishop in Italy, Bishop Dionysi, 
uh, pose the question, what is actually orthodoxy? Because it's something that uh, people are contemplating with the change of paradigms in Orthodox Catholic relations now uh, that have been brought to light, uh, particularly now after the beginning of the war. And he asked the question, what is actually orthodoxy? What is the glory and truth of orthodoxy? It is love. God is love. Without love, there is no orthodoxy. Without uh, orthodoxy, without orthopraxy, that is without love in its practice, is in fact a real heresy, he said so. Father Cyril and the Ukrainian Catholic bishop in uh, Italy are kind of on the same wavelength there. There's also an uh, expression of unity in diversity. For example, the case of Lviv, which is a major city in Western Ukraine, which was kind of the heartland of the Greek Catholics. Before the Second World War, there were actually three Catholic archbishops of the same city. One was for the Byzantine Rite, one was for the Roman Catholic Church, and one was for the Armenian Catholic Church, which has a historic community in Ukraine since even before the 14th century. And in the Matan Nadaran in, in uh, Yerevan, you can see a map where all sorts of tiny little villages of Western Ukraine have historic and important Armenian communities. And in fact, in, uh, during Pope John Paul II's visit to Ukraine in 2001, he was greeted by two Catholic cardinals of the same city, one for the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church of the Byzantine Rite and one uh, Roman Catholic. So when asking the question, what kind of solidarities among churches and lay movements are helpful to delegitimize Putin's weaponization of religion as a justification of war and what kinds of actions or discourses are counterproductive, one might point out that in Ukraine, there's actually no official national church, even though there is a his the historic uh, majority of Orthodox Christians, there is no one kind of preferred religion, as uh, is the case in Russia. There are a lot of uh, ecumenical initiatives. One could uh, list, for example, the community of Sant'Egidio, which has a presence in, in Ukraine, uh, Caritas, um, Ukrainian Catholic University is an important center of education that has both Catholic and Orthodox professors. Uh, one thing, I one organization I would highlight, though, is the All Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations, which um, includes Christian, Jewish, and Muslim religious leaders. Among the Christians, there are Orthodox, Catholics, and Protestants. And among the Orthodox, there are the, the heads of the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine, as well as the uh, Orthodox Church of uh, Ukraine, which received the Thomas of Autocephaly from Patriarch Bartholomew, that is uh, independent, ecclesiastical independence. So uh, this organization has a rotating head and they issue statements on various questions of uh, ethical, educational, government policy, uh, and most recently uh, against the war in Ukraine right now, even appealing directly to other countries and international organizations, for example, for a no-fly zone or appealing to other countries, for example, Belarus, not to send its troops into Ukraine. Um, it's worth noting also that, for example, last year on Ukrainian Independence Day, the heads of all these different members of the, this Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations all gathered and had each of their representatives say a prayer or some of them were more like a speech in front of the, the Church of St. Sophia, the main shrine of Ukraine, uh, Church of Holy Wisdom. Um, in all of this, one, of course, needs to be aware and um, cautious about uh, the border between good patriotism and national poli nationalist politics, of uh, the emphasis on local church versus universal mission of the church. Um, and these organizations were kind of the diverse and um, mosaic of religious life in Ukraine kind of helped to counter all of this. And I'll just, the last image is just of the daily statements from the head of the uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, his Beatitude Sviatoslav, uh, who has messages there every day giving a summary. So the participants here might be interested to watch those. They give a um, summary of the daily events and are actually sometimes difficult to accept for a lot of the citizens of Ukraine uh, who are being bombarded. And in fact, the majority of casualties in the war so far are peaceful uh, civilian citizens where the head of this church is calling for peace and re reconciliation even in the midst of war. So uh, the message of the gospel is something sometimes even difficult to hear when you're being bombarded. Nevertheless, it's there and it's present. So. 
on that, I'll pass the word back to you, George. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for that, Father Daniel. Um, one of the great things about your presentation is it, it really lifts up the fact that uh, something that most people don't realize, but that Ukraine is, is frankly probably the most religiously diverse place in Europe. Um, because of Putin's instrumentalization of the Orthodox Church and the fact that the Orthodox Church in Ukraine is under Moscow, people tend to think of it as a largely Orthodox or uh, Greek Catholic space, but that it is, in fact, that there are Protestants, there are Jews, there are Muslims. It, it's one of the most, it probably is the most religiously diverse place in Europe, and, and that's something very important. Um, we turn now to Sergei, um, who uh, has his own insights, uh, used, used to work for the Moscow Patriarchate and has his own insights um, about the situation uh, in Russia and um, the extent to which this is or is not um, a religious war. Uh, Sergei. Yeah. Um, could you hear me? That's okay. Yeah, good. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you, Meritz. Um, well, I, I think the, uh, I will speak from Russian perspective, but, um, well, I'm the, I'm in the United States now, so, um, I can speak freely, but, uh, uh, one, uh, important note, uh, uh, we have to keep in mind all the time that according to the last uh, legislation uh, that Russian parliament adopted and, the, and Putin signed uh, a week ago, uh, Russians are not allowed or, or will be punished by or um, imprisoned uh, by calling our uh, war in Ukraine actually war and aggression. And yesterday, um, uh, a priest from uh, Karabanova, uh, Father uh, John, uh, was uh, um, sued uh, and he uh, was forced to, to take the appeal for peace in Ukraine from the, his parish uh, website and he has to pay penalty uh, 35,000 uh, rubles, uh, which is now approximately uh, 200 um, uh, dollars, but uh, his salary is, as a parish priest in the village, uh, is 100 dollars. So it's, um, uh, well, it's a serious punishment in terms of Russian province. So uh, when um, uh, we're speaking about war, uh, we, of course, we are all uh, actually shocked that uh, none of Russian uh, bishops uh, was uh, courageous enough uh, to say that uh, this is not the uh, special uh, military operation, uh, as the uh, Kremlin and official propaganda call it, uh, but it's war. And uh, we were waiting that uh, Petro Kirill will sort of say this uh, word, and he didn't. We were waiting that uh, Metropolitan Hilarion uh, will say that this is uh, the war, uh, and he didn't. Um, and um, the uh, main problem now, I think that, that it's absolutely clear that um, uh, modern Russian church um, is not honest, and it seems that uh, their officials are lost this ability to be honest. And that's really serious because um, uh, we're actually expecting uh, that uh, they, will, uh, uh, they will at least uh, say these simple words of truth. So my point is that um, the church, that the Orthodox church that we have in Russia uh, first is, uh, is a divided church. We have uh, the official church on one hand, and this is the church where the main voice is the voice uh, of the of Patriarch Kirill. Uh, and we have the uh, uh, grassroots level communities that feel uh, that they are uh, kind of are something different from what um, uh, Patriarch Kirill is saying in, and doing. 
they are still in the structure of the church, uh, uh, but they they uh, they are very unhappy with what is going with the official church for at least five, seven, or even ten years. So. Um, the, and the official churches, we, we had discussions with Father Kirill for, for years, uh, how we shall, shall call that. And uh, for a kind of short period of time, for a few years, we were thinking that uh, the, 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 the proper term will be kind of post-Soviet civil religion uh, that was actually wrapped in uh, Orthodox uh, um, rituals and uh, traditions. Uh, but in fact, it's something different. Uh, and uh, yes, I agree, we should sort of clearly say that it's a heresy. Uh, and uh, the, the churches, uh, the, the family of Orthodox churches um, around the world should uh, take that uh, seriously. Uh, and uh, if, I, I would say even that after the, 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 this, uh, the, the war started, I think the, the, the question of whether uh, the Moscow Patriarchate or the Russian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate should continue to exist is a big question. I think this is the, um, um, the Stalin's project. You know that the uh, church uh, as the official body in Soviet Union uh, was established in mid 40s, actually we're going again back to, to, to the mid 20th century uh, and uh, this church was, was something different from the church that we had before the uh, Bolshevik revolution before the 1917 though the, 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 the problems of the church were, uh, were more or less the same but uh, strictly saying that uh, the, the, the Stalin's project of Moscow Patriarchate now is over and uh, what shall we do next? Maybe we have to reestablish uh, the, the uh, Orthodox Church in Russia. That's the question. But it seems that um, we can't reform the Moscow Patriarchate. It's so, uh, it's just merged with Putin's state and what uh, Father uh, Cyril is calling Putinization uh, of the church. Uh, um, is uh, there's no way back. I mean, that's that's kind of that's that's the dead end. The church is the a, not just the alley of the uh, state, but is a part of um, the Putin state, uh, and we can do nothing nothing with that. And the second problem here is that I would say that uh, at least half of the population uh, of the uh, country. Uh, do support uh, Putin. And it seems that half of the church uh, do support Putin and Patriarch. Uh, so what shall we do with that? Uh, I don't have the answer again. Uh, and we see how the uh, uh, sort of semi uh, kind of uh, civil organizations, uh, semi ecclesial organizations like Sorok Sarakov, the movement, the lay movement, uh, Sorok Sarakov called in Russian. Uh, they joined this uh, state propaganda with uh, sort of fascist uh, symbols and um, uh, fascist um, aesthetics. Um, they, 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 they just started to copy these um, uh, images within days. Um, and the, that, that means that the uh, active part of uh, loyal to the patriarchal uh, lay uh, organizations, uh, they, they clearly state that they are on Putin's, Putin's side. And the, their main uh, slogan, which was uh, popular for last um, 20, 25 years, uh, we are Russians uh, and God with us is now a completely fascist slogan. That, uh, uh, that's a tragedy and that's the tragedy of Russia too. So um, uh, we are with our prayers are with uh, the suffering people in Ukraine, uh, with um, suffering people in Russia, you know that uh, at least uh, 300,000 um, refugees from Russia during uh, last two weeks 
and that's also the 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 the, the biggest plea out of Russia since um, our early nineties. Um, and um, yes, I think that's maybe questions after this. Thank you very much. Um, I'm still in shock, and it's not easy for me to talk. Sorry. Thank you, Sergey. Um, we're, we're delighted to welcome His Eminence, um, Archbishop Angelos, who, who, is, who is now joined us. Uh, right on cue, Your Eminence, because you were up next. So if uh, you would uh, like to offer some uh, opening comments. Thank you, uh, Professor, and thank you to all of you. I'm sorry I couldn't join earlier. I did have a prior engagement, but I didn't want to miss this opportunity to be with you. Uh, the problem in a setting like this, when I've come in and I haven't heard, is um, I, I, I make myself more likely to fall foul of uh, saying things that are totally irrelevant and uh, probably not very helpful. But um, I, I think I'm the least qualified to be here among you. Um, I am a, a clergyman. I, I, uh, I do ecumenical work. I have very strong ties ecumenically in I think what's asked of me is to present uh, my perspective. Um, I really feel that um, in the current, in the last weeks, our attention has been so focused on media, whether it's a 24 hour media or, or our news feeds, um, to look at this as uh, what it is. It is uh, a geopolitical problem that is about borders and about sovereignty and about um, neighbors and about uh, uh, relationships regionally, as well as bilaterally and multilaterally. And I think what I have seen more tragically is the church being pulled in to this scenario, to this narrative as an, an actor, sometimes uh, by design and sometimes just by mere presence and association. When we look at our Ukrainian sisters and brothers uh, in the UK, and of course those who are coming across the borders so much, we see that there is a mass trauma that is happening because of something that comes from a neighbor. And we see that trauma emerging from both sides. Um, I am just learning over these last months what a great uh, and, and a very sizable relationship there is between the Ukrainian community, both in Ukraine and abroad, and the Russian community in Russia and Ukraine and abroad. And I think the church here must always draw a line of being a servant of the people. But of course, we as churches sometimes get drawn into very simplified narratives that are seen to be black and white. Narratives that are oversimplified and pulled into uh, political scenarios and geopolitical scenarios. And sometimes again, by design or by implication, we find ourselves in situations where we are drawn into a conversation that is not ours. I think looking at the church and, and our main role as the church, as the stewards in this, in this world, stewards amongst our own communities, but also stewards of the world, of neighbors, uh, of, of people we deal with on a daily basis. I think we, I see ourselves as having to rise above political delineation and simple political affiliation. And sometimes in our responses, we end up responding defensively and finding ourselves having to place ourselves on one side of an equation or another. Uh, when we look at our own situation as Coptic Orthodox Church, it is absolutely legitimate and I think uh, essential that we are able to look at the sufferings of those around us with an eye that looks at the human suffering 
that is complex and that has a variety of um, relationships and interrelationships. And so the challenge I've had is listening to what the Moscow Patriarchate has done or what the Ukrainian church has done, um, whichever expression of the Ukrainian church, Ukrainian Orthodox church, Ukrainian Greek Catholic church. And people then will put them into branches and pockets where they are seen to be at enmity with each other. But I think in the complexity of war, it is very difficult to look at those relationships in isolation. Uh, this, is, this is not a religious war as far as I can see it. This is not about the church. This is about political powers um, globally and regionally that are expressing themselves in particular ways. And the church becomes um, a part of that scenario. Uh, I know that in Egypt, uh, when we were going through various things, including the, the presence of the Muslim Brotherhood and others, the church time and time again um, was subject to attempts of being dragged into a scenario that made us try to pick sides. And we could see what it was, what, what it was happening. Um, People were trying to legitimize theologically and in terms of ecclesiology, what our position should be. But our position first and foremost must be servants of the people. And the more we can sit neutrally and serve all sides, the more we can be a light in the darkness that, that surrounds us so, so dramatically, especially in these days. I mean, we haven't seen this, this kind of uh, we haven't seen these images in Europe in most people's living history. Um, refugees and displacement, internal and external, that was something that happened way on the other side of seas and, 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 and continents. But now that it is here, uh, and I've seen, as I, as I said, I've been to the Ukrainian Catholic Cathedral in London, where they are preparing to receive potentially hundreds of thousands. Um, speaking to my Russian Orthodox brothers uh, here in London. Again, they're expecting to see people coming in um, who will align themselves with the Russian Orthodox Church because that's where they see their affiliation, their identity. And um, the church is then going to be in a position where you know, a lot, vast uh, proportion of its own faithful and its clergy are either Ukrainian or have Ukrainian connections. So unless we are able to look at the complexity of this issue and take ourselves out of the polarized view of what is there, we are not going to feel able to fulfill our role as churches. Um, orthodoxy is not one thing. Uh, it, it is a, a line of, of Christian tradition. Each church has its own culture and small t tradition. Uh, it also has its own uh, historic historical context and its experience. Um, but we stand in each other's shoes and try to see what we can do to help and how we can be bridges for peace and reconciliation. Um, vilification, demonization, um, and blame are, are not really going to help. Um, I think if we try to sit somewhere where we can look at experience and see what it is that we can see as a commonality and try to build bridges, that is where we're going to find our greatest strength. Because don't forget, wars have come and gone and the church remains because the church is there to serve its people. And actually it is there to serve at the darkest times. And if we make ourselves party to the conflicts, we are unable to serve properly. And so I, I look upon this with much pain, um, personally, because I know personally the people who are involved. I've heard stories of people who have lost loved ones. Uh, I look at it with pain as a clergyman. Uh, I look at it with pain as someone who's involved in the ecumenical world. 
And I pray that we are able, as the church of God, the church separated now, as it may be, that the church is able to, to stand together and be a support for all its members uh, and to be able to shine light into oppressive darkness and give hope into apparently hopeless situations that we find ourselves in today. These are just my personal reflections. Uh, I am sure people will agree and disagree with some or much or all that I've said, but uh, I do think that we need to look at this situation in the complexity that it, that it really deserves and not try to look at polarized and um, monochromatic points of view that are depicted by, by some. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, Dr. Tadros. Well, actually, the least qualified here is me. We've just been very privileged to hear the, the, the perspective of his eminence um, being part of the ecumenical movement um, in the Orthodox Church. We have been very privileged to hear Father Cyril and Father Daniel, who are Ukrainian. We've been very privileged to hear uh, Sergei um, from the perspective of a Russian Orthodox who is independent of the, of the uh, Russian Orthodox um, leadership's position. And we've been very privileged to hear um, George in his uh, many, many years uh, of expertise analyzing and understanding the, the nature of orthodoxy. So I come here, um, I come to this with none of these kinds of expertise. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be very, very short, but I'm approaching this from the perspective of someone who's looking at the future of democracy in Europe um, and the relationship between freedom of religion or belief and uh, people's power and civil society, social movements, and what does it mean for the future of freedom of religion or belief as part of democracy um, as a whole. And I think this is where um, I'm engaging with two uh, deeply problematic narratives. The first um, is skeptics of freedom of religion or belief. And by the way, our program is called the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development. Our whole idea was that we bring to processes of positive change, the dimension that people's freedom of conscience, right to freedom of religion, right to religious equality is fundamental to well-being. Um, so skeptics will say, look at what Putin is doing. This is what happens when you allow freedom of religion or belief. He is using religion to um, uh, promote religious triumphalism, to engage in religious supremacy, and people are the victims. And of course, with freedom of religion and belief, we must always remember that it is not the right of a religion. It is the right of a people. It is the right of individuals. This is not the right of any particular religion to impose its ideology and to homogenize society in the name of uh, the righteousness of um, its cause or that it is the better ideology. It is rather the freedom of individuals and people to choose to believe or not believe. Um, and that religious pluralism has to uh, means that in, in many incidents, historically and in present, such as in this present moment here, in this situation of the Russian invasion on Ukraine, on the Russian aggression on Ukraine, we are seeing a case where if we are going to defend freedom of religion or belief, we must defend the people of Ukraine from the imposition of a religiously homogenizing, a religiously totalitizing ideology upon them. That is the irony of it, is that freedom of religion or belief, the protection of religious pluralism necessitates at times that we protect from religion itself uh, so that people can enjoy the freedom of conscience that they deserve. The second point that I would want to make and I'm going to be very, very quickly, uh, very quick about this, is that we have two sets of, of narratives by Putin which are very intertwined. The first is the idea that he is the, the defender of the faith against a decadent secularism in the West. Um, and it is a, is a, it's a kind of pitting the higher moral grounds of religion 
versus a secularism um, that is individualistic, that uh, doesn't respect people's freedoms, um, etc. And I think the caution here is that we must be very, very careful not to make this into a case of religion versus secularism. Because as has been shown by Father Cyril, by Father Daniel, um, um, references made by George and his eminence, um, there is a plurality of voices in the Orthodox Church, and there is no monopoly in who represents the Orthodox world. This is, this is a case where um, there are different leaderships, different patriarchs, at least 14, um, and there isn't a situation in which um, any uh, the, the Russian or any other church can claim to represent a highly varied um, uh, popula well, world, uh, really. So um, uh, given that the Ukrainian people, 68% of them, according to one statistic, um, uh, our, uh, our believers have a ha, ha, purport to a certain belief system. Um, it means that if we are going to pit this as secularism versus religiosity, it's going to be a negation of a fundamental dimension of their identity that they want, you know, they hold to democracy, but they also are very proud of the faith that they hold. So we must not allow that to happen because that would feed into that narrative, which um, which would then vilify uh, a whole group of people. The other thing is the vilification of the Russian Orthodox uh, lay people and clergy who have risen against the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, I'll put in the chat function, but so far we have 186 Russian Orthodox clergy with people like, you know, the, the examples that um, Sergei gave of, you know, a, a clergy speaking up against war, 100, 186 who have said this war is not in our name, no to war. And I think it's really important in that sense to remember the diversity within any followers of, of belief so that um, no one can claim a, a monopoly on the faith, on any particular faith. The fact that the Russian uh, Orthodox leadership purports to um, be the, the representative of, uh, of a large cohort does not mean that it is the only representative, nor does it can speak for every single Russian Orthodox. And that's why we really shouldn't allow this binary um, um, to happen. Um, Sorry, I, I gave a, a wrong number. It's 286 Russian clergy. I put it in the function room now. The, uh, uh, the, the chat room, sorry. Um, the other thing, the, the, the next question is, well, what has uh, happened in Ukraine with its assault on the idea of religious pluralism in all its richness, in all its intersection of ethnic and religious and geographic diversity, that, that assault that has happened in the name of one particular uh, political power through its weaponization of another, um, makes us uh, be very, very careful about what is awaiting the rest of Europe. What will it mean for the rest of Europe? Because um, we are very concerned that where there are very strong cohorts of followers of the Orthodox faith who have sat on the fence, on the fence in, um, in Europe, uh, Bulgaria and Serbia, for example, who have not openly condemned um, the assault. And of course, Belarus is part of the Russian Orthodox Church, that the assault to religious pluralism in Ukraine will embolden those who believe in a religiously homogenous society where there is no freedom of conscience for individuals to contest and challenge their own churches or contest anyone who's using religion for political purposes, that their voices will be muted. In other words, is the ripple effect of encroachments on religious pluralism in Ukraine potentially on other countries in Europe. And the fact that the West um, some Western narratives, that's not generalized, some Western narratives uh, fall into Putin's trap of seeing uh, a secular West. And here, unfortunately, secular uh, isn't with the wonderful broad understanding of division of state and church. It's secular as in they they believe Putin's narrative of secular meaning anti-religion, elimination of religion. Um, we, we, this, is the na this is the time now for us to engage with the Orthodox and, um, and uh, followers of all faith and non-faith in Europe, such that there isn't this take on 
Putin's discourse, which is spreading extremely quickly in the orthodox um, and non-orthodox parts of uh, Europe, where there is an attempt uh, for a de- uh, for a legitimiz- leg- legitimization of what's going on in the name of religion. Um, so I think the, the importance of Western narratives not to fall into the trap of saying, well, we are here in Europe to liberate from the, um, the authoritarianism of religion, because as, as, as George said, um, uh, Putin doesn't have the right to speak in the name of religion. And sometimes in the name of protecting freedom of religion or belief, we have to challenge um, religious forces in the way they unfold. I'll stop there. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, Maurice. I, I think I speak for everyone else when, when, when I say that we all want your energy. Um, <laughs> we, all, we all want your energy and passion. Um, so the, the way we are going to proceed from here, um, we, we've all heard one another speak. I'd like to just really op- open the floor uh, to let our panelists uh, respond to some of the opening comments um, uh, that, that we heard from the others. Um, and then there are several people who have um, put questions in, into the Q&A feature. I, I've jotted some down. I have plenty of questions that we could go there. Um, but we're going to let our uh, our fellow, fellow panelists respond to one another first. I saw Sergey's hand first, then Deacon Daniel, and then uh, Father Cyril. Yes, thank you. Just one more note. I think it's quite important now to... Um, show that uh, Christians are Catholics, Orthodox of other local churches, Protestants, um, they are, are, they should say clearly that uh, they, uh, the uh, position of the, of Patriarch Kirill and the official church of Moscow is absolutely unacceptable from the Christian perspective, not just theology, but the, the, the basics uh, of the New Testament. Because uh, the, uh, the 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 sort of the diplomacy of Moscow Patriarchate is, if they have some problems in communication with the Ecumenical Patriarchate, they switch to our Pope of Rome and trying to develop uh, um, relations with um, uh, with the Catholic Church. Uh, then uh, they step back. They they're trying to communicate with uh, uh, conservative Protestants in Texas or, or whatsoever. Uh, so, so the idea now is uh, that the Christian world in, in a very broad sense of this word should say uh, uh, a clear word um, against uh, the, this uh, uh, political position uh, of of the Moscow Patriarchate. This is uh, one thing. And the second thing, uh, which is also uh, very uh, popular in uh, Putin's uh, foreign policy, and as well in the foreign policy uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church, actually is money. They are sending money to parishes. They are sending money to seminaries outside um, Russia. Uh, not just only to the parishes and uh, other ecclesial uh, organizations of the Russian Orthodox Church, but other local churches. In fact, we should say that they are just buying this, they are buying priests, they are buying um, uh, religious organizations, and we should stop this. This is really dirty money. Just stop uh, receiving them. And we should state that clearly. Thank you. Father Daniel. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like uh, to highlight three points from what was said so far. Um, His Eminence Archbishop Angelus mentioned it's important to be informed, and I think it's also important to understand the names of the different groups involved here. You mentioned the Russian Orthodox Church, but it's important to know at least one other name of a group in Ukraine, uh, whether it's Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Ukrainian or- Orthodox Church of Ukraine, that uh, is as uh, Tomas Avadosefli from Patriarch Const- uh, Constantinople or other things like that. So just I think it's important that people get informed and educated and able to name names as was mentioned. Uh, uh, also about the comment of your eminence about being dragged into a conversation. I think this is very a very important point to make because there are questions in the chat about 
dialogue and how to continue dialogue. And very often it can become a monologue where it's manipulated and uh, people get taken advantage of for a photo op. One, one could mention, for example, Pope Francis arrived at the Russian embassy at, to the Holy See on the Friday, and the only people that had a photo or a press release were uh, TAS and the Moscow Patriarchate, but the Vatican didn't share that photo. That's just one small example of the desire for sincere and honest exchange and dialogue that then uh, can be taken and uh, spun around for one's own purpose. And I'd just like to thank uh, Sergei for bringing up the prophetic voice of the past, for example, of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, uh, ROKOR, uh, that uh, growing up, I remember that the one group that seemed to be more anti-communist than the, the Greek Catholics or the Uniates was ROKOR. They were even more uh, opposed to communism. And then in 2007, with the reunification, uh, it seems as if all that was forgotten. So the prophetic voice, even somebody like Father uh, Alexander Webster's book, The Price of Prophecy, the book on Orthodox churches in Eastern Europe uh, in up until I think the early 90s is an excellent book. Um, I, it would be wonderful to read a second book by Father Alexander, but I think his position has slightly changed on these questions. Um, anyway, those are just some thoughts on the, what was said. I think Father Cyril, um, and, and then uh, uh, His Eminence. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the panelists, uh, the panelists for uh, for your takes on, on the uh, on the war. Um, uh, I agree that um, we need to be cautious in our judgments. Uh, we need to choose carefully our words. Uh, we need not to overstep and overstretch our arguments. At the same time, I believe uh, we should not relativize what is going on. Well, it's not just the political division, the blood has been shed and it continues to shed. Uh, we, yes, we can step over, we can you know, bridge easily uh, the divides caused by the political differences. It's much harder to bridge the gaps that have, has been, that have been created because of the bloodshed. Uh, and um, also this war is really a day of judgment. It's, a, it's really oh, the period of judgment, if you want. But things need to be said. Need, things need to be named as they are without you know, euphemisms, without uh, blurring, without relativization. Because this kind of relativization, I believe, has contributed to this war. Uh, when people refused, you know, to call the war what happened in Ukraine, what has happened in Ukraine since 2014, when people refused to recognize who is the perpetrator and who is the victim, even in the statements of the WCC, for example, this statement which was produced in 2015 after the delegation headed by the general secretary of the WCC visited Ukraine, they produced an obscure statement which relativized some other things. They called it a civil war, whatever. They, they refused to name. Uh, who is to blame? I think this kind of unclarity, this kind of confusion uh, has contributed to the escalation of the war where we are. That's, what, that's why in order to avoid this kind of escalation, in order to, uh, to never uh, repeat it again, we need to name things right now by their proper names and need, and need to make our judgments very clearly. Thank you. Your eminence. Thank you, and, and I, I thoroughly agree with Deacon Daniel. I think whether we're talking about the, uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church or the Autocephalous Church, um, I think it's up to us as the church to start um, ex explaining a bit more of the complexity. Um, I mean, I, I've been following the developments, um, and it's only because I've asked and I have friends here in the UK and abroad that I've been able to ask that I've understood um, and, and, but I think when you ask the general person who is informed by 24 hour news and very simplified language around the church must be evil because I mean, people who have that agenda will vilify the church across the board and therefore take away our ability to be a bridge of reconciliation. And, and Father Cyril, I, I agree again, you know, in Egypt, when there were clashes between you know, when there were attacks of Muslims on Christians and that was called uh, sectarian violence, there was nothing more offensive because it just, it, it, it blurs lines of what's happening. 
Um, but I'm also a firm believer of not backing parties into a corner they can't come out of. And I think we always need to leave lines of communication and ways back to a table to speak, to converse, to reconcile, to work together. And the more the polarizing language escalates at the moment, the less opportunity we have to try to fix things even within, within church. I mean, we've seen, we've seen schisms in the past that have been resolved. We've seen separations that have been, you know, that, that have been overcome. And I just think we need to realize that this is a time as we continue to focus on the bloodshed today and the lives shattered today and the communities broken today, we need to look at that immediately, but we also need to look beyond that into what are the means of fixing this in the long term and how do we leave opportunities of reconciliation that we don't boundary off too, too strongly. Uh, th thank you, Your Eminence. Um, Dr. Tadros, uh, everyone else has uh, ha had a comment uh, on the opening statements. Would you like to add anything else before we go to some of the questions? Very, very quickly. I think there is um, there is a need for us to be very clear about when we use certain concepts, what do we mean by them? And of course, this is not an academic panel. It's one for us to engage about um, issues where people are really suffering to the extreme. But um, I think from the perspective of uh, the promotion of freedom of religion or belief for individuals, groups, and peoples. Um, there is a, an there, there is an, it is important to recognize that the church isn't just the leadership. The church is um, everyone who um, who uh, follows a particular faith, and therefore uh, people have the right to have their own opinions that are independent of and different to the leadership of the church. And that is the beauty of pluralism. And that is why the church as part of civil society necessitates that we do have a, uh, an environment where pluralism thrives. So that there is a, a church leadership with a particular view, but there are also citizens who follow a faith, who have their own organizations, their own um, movements, who also um, are able to voice a counter view without uh, feeling marginalized or undermined. And I think that is where, that's the real challenge for us for Europe now. How are we going to protect the spaces for civil society and for pluralism such that we are able to um, protect those freedoms for all in the upcoming uh, weeks and months and years? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marie. So, so we have many wonderful questions in the chat. Um, as, as it's been going on, um, some of our panelists have responded to, uh, to some of them by typing, but um, not everybody can see that. So I'm going to ask a couple of these questions because I think um, we, we, we envision this panel as really being educational to a broader public. And, and so some of these things I think are really important. One of them that Father Cyril uh, put an answer to, I, I'd like to have him uh, answer uh, for everyone, which is uh, a question, does the Orthodox Church, and I always use that word very broadly, I don't discriminate between Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian, so your eminence weigh in as well. Um, uh, does the Orthodox Church have a just war theory? Right? Um, it, are there principles like established either in the tradition or in canon law to adjudicate um, a war that seemed like, like this one that seems so clearly lopsided in terms of aggressor, right? Um, uh, does, does the Orthodox Church have that kind of language, um, vocab vocabulary tradition? So Father Cyril, why don't you start and then anyone else who'd like to weigh in? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, well, the difference between probably the Eastern churches, including the Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian churches, and the Western churches, is that in the East, we don't have codifications either of canon law or of, of some uh, theopolitical theories, including the theory of just, uh, just war. Uh, we are based on precedents and we are based on different witnesses in our tradition, which, which is the patristic uh, tradition. And in the patristic past, we could we could find you know arguments and words in support of both justice, just uh, just war theory, and in 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 support of pacifism. And nowadays, what I hear, the voices, especially from Russia, uh, a number of priests, uh, kind of outspoken, famous priests, have uh, spoken against 
uh, you know, peace. They say peace is a sin in our days. Peace is something unacceptable. We need to go for war at any price to the final end. This is, of course, this is horrible. And I think this is sin to, to make these kind of statements. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, I believe this is a task for our modern uh, Orthodox political theology. And in this task, I think we should join our efforts. I mean, the, Orthodox, the Byzantine churches and the non-Byzantine Oriental churches to produce um, a, a, a kind of consensus-based uh, theory, theology of peace, of, um, of, uh, of addressing violence. This is an imminent task. We need to, we, we haven't done it yet, but we should do it. Thank you. Um, Sergey. Yes, um, I would like to add that uh, during uh, 60s, 70s and 80s um, within the ecumenical movement and the World Council of Churches especially, uh, uh, there were serious attempts to address these uh, problems. But unfortunately, I could speak um, uh, for the Russian Orthodox Church, these problems and this language are, and these uh, concepts were sort of totally forgotten uh, because the agenda of the Cold War uh, is not that, was not that important for 90s and uh, later on for the beginning of the 21st century. But I think we have to return uh, to the papers uh, that were uh, prepared in 70s and 80s. Uh, they will give us at least the, the basis for further discussions. Your Eminence. Thank you, Professor. Um, so in, in our church in particular, we don't have uh, a, a just war teaching. Uh, and I suppose that may come from the fact that we've lived persecution for most of the time and we have, we're not a state church and we haven't had to play into that dynamic. Uh, just addressing a couple of um, the, the questions that I've seen come up. Um, it, it's never too soon to preach. It's never too soon to preach. If I don't preach, I need to be here. I'm not a politician. I, 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 I must say, great sham, I'm not academic. I am here as a clergyman. And if I don't preach, then the world is really in a bad place. And if I'm not looking towards reconciliation, then I don't, shouldn't be here. And yes, I'm really sorry. I did forget the word Ukrainian and I stumbled a bit. But that's because I ran into this room to be with you and not miss this opportunity. But I did not miss, forget the Ukrainians when I stood with them in Trafalgar Square last Saturday. I did not forget the Ukrainians when I was with Archbishop Kenneth at his cathedral on Tuesday. I did not forget the Ukrainians when I was at the cathedral with church leaders on Wednesday morning. And I did not forget the Russians when I had uh, Father Stephen in my office yesterday. Uh Thank, thank you, Your Eminence. Um, for those of you who, who do want to know more about um, a, a sort of academic take on orthodoxy and just war, there was a book um, published by the University of Notre Dame. It's an edited volume that I had an essay in uh, maybe five or six years ago. It's edited by um, Father Perry Hamalis and Val Valerie Karras. Uh, and I believe the title is Orthodox Approaches to War and Violence. And it's, it's sort of a, it, it's both historical and theological, ethical. It ha has a lot of different perspectives in it, um, but obviously rather relevant. Um, again, lots of interesting questions in the, in the chat. We probably, or in the Q&A, we probably won't get to all of them. Um, uh, you, you know, several people have talked about, you, you know, ecumenical responsibility here and, and in the chat, somebody uses the phrase, I, 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 I don't see it right now, but someone has used the phrase, the ecumenism of the gulag, right? Um, uh, and, and I've heard a similar um, expression, uh, your eminence, when, when, when uh, the Coptic church was going through so many horrible things, you know, over, over the last decade, we talked about the ecumenism of blood. Right, um, that 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 we saw against all Christian traditions uh, in the Middle East. Um, God works providentially, right? It, is there a possibility um, that the crisis in Ukraine, which is not only affecting one religious tradition, um, but but all are suffering, um, is is there a, a and, and those in Russia who are protesting against it, and many of them are going to suffer for it. Right. Is, is there a sort of window here for uh, an ecumenism 
of the gulag. Um, would anybody like to comment on that? Uh, Father Daniel? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's already happening if one follows the statements, not just of the Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations, but just the personal statements of your average uh, Orthodox or Greek Catholic or Roman Catholic priest, your pastor, a rabbi, that they are expressing their, their horror at these things that their communities all experienced during the Second World War and the bombing of the radio tower right near Babin Yar, the Holocaust Memorial, the place where um, thousands of Jewish people were killed during the Second World War was condemned by everybody. Um, so I think in this case, everybody understands that the, both of the bombs that are falling do not discriminate uh, based on religion. And so also the charitable work that is going on, a lot of the organizations are saying they don't, whoever comes to them, there was an appeal by uh, the papal envoys uh, to Ukraine right now, Cardinal Krajewski saying that, and echoed by all religious leaders that gathered in the Lviv Cathedral yesterday, uh, Roman Catholic Cathedral for prayer saying that this chair, the, the humanitarian aid goes to everyone. Um, and this sounds to sounds like it echoes what was being said both in uh, the Solovki prison that one can read in accounts of Orthodox, uh, new martyrs that experienced this when encountering uh, Catholic or Protestants there, and also in the memoirs of Cardinal Joseph Slipi that was um, embracing his Orthodox or Protestant uh, brothers in in the prisons and oftentimes there was greater suspicion of one's own people that seemed to have collaborated with secret services than with the people that were on let's say the other side of the fence ecclesiastically uh, who uh, whose suffering was evident so i think we're reliving a lot of that that was experienced during the second world war already in these two weeks uh, father cyril and then sergey Right, thank you. Uh, yes, um, as, as we know, uh, the Western political theology in its present form uh, has been born as the theology of the Auschwitz, uh, as a reflection on the tragedies of the World War II. Uh, in the Orthodox world, unfortunately, we haven't been able to develop any sort of theology after Holodomor or after the uh, Greek or Syriac or, um, or Armenian genocides. We haven't been able, yes, we suffered huge losses and we were unable to uh, to reflect theologically uh, uh, on those losses we did reflect on culturally or you know politically but not not exactly theologically and it seems we have we we really have in our in our own traditions we had historically in the 20th century and in the 21st century now so many reasons uh, so many uh, driving uh, like, like momenta driving forces to bring us to the point of developing a political, proper political theology up to date, up to the point we are unable to do that. Uh, and now we need, we, now we really need to address this. We need to develop a theology with, which would be simultaneously a post Holodomor theology, a post Gulag theology, a post uh, uh, genocide, Greek, Syriac, uh, Armenian genocide theology. Now, probably a post Ukrainian, Russian, uh, Russo-Ukrainian war theology, because all those things happen, or not necessarily because of the lack of theology, but certainly theology may help us to overcome to overcome those tra tra tragedies, to uh, to make some sense for ourselves what we should do about this, uh, these uh, uh, these tragedies, and maybe eventually to prevent similar, uh, similar tragedies, tragedies in the future. That's why we needed this kind of theology, post-Gulag, post-Holodomor, post-war theologies. Thank you. Sergey? Yes, I do agree with Father Cyril that, um, in fact, we uh, didn't have this uh, after Gulag theology and the attempts, actually the, the only group uh, theology after Gulag, as far as I know, was formed in the Amsterdam University uh, by Katya Tolstoy, Professor Katya Tolstoy. Uh, the, the problem in Russia itself, and um, I think that's, that's really the huge problem, is that uh, theology uh, cannot develop uh, under 
ideological pressure. And we have really a uh, very strong ideological pressure from the state um, on the church and from church officials uh, on uh, the theologians within the Russian church um, that uh, the uh, idea of the empire is the uh, sort of the, the, the key uh, idea and nothing should be um, sort of uh, questioning the, 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 the um, uh, sacred status, status of the empire. And in fact, within the Russian, uh, uh, modern Russian philosophy of history, uh, Soviet empire is an integral part of the historical empire on the territory of uh, Russia. So uh, you have to be very accurate and uh, not too critical against the, 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 the Stalin regime and the, the Soviet Union in all its phases. Uh, and th there's, there's no way to develop um, theology of uh, Gulag in this context. So we have to overcome first this uh, 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 Soviet uh, piety, I would say, uh, and then uh, develop uh, true theology. Um, either uh, your eminence or um... Uh, Marise, would either of you like to comment on this question of the, the or, or just sort of the even maybe a comment on just the ecumenical potential um, here? I, I know you're very involved with it, Your Eminence, but would you like to say anything more about that? I, I think I already see um, ecumenical engagement happening. Uh, there are attempts to try to uh, approach various sides. Uh, including the Moscow Patriarchate and the, the various manifestations of the, of the church in uh, Ukraine. Um, unfortunately, none of them have been successful yet. I think uh, these are very early days and regrettably this will go on, unfortunately, for longer. But um, what we must continue with the ecumenical world is unlike news sources, uh, who switch off once the cameras go away. These are our sisters and our brothers, and we must continue to engage even after the world stops talking about this. Uh, this is an ongoing plight with ongoing suffering with the internal and external displacement of hundreds of thousands, not millions over time. And, and we must continue to try to engage, even if we hit um, dead ends, we, we must continue to find other ways of um, as a church, finding a way for us, our children who are suffering. Thank you, Your Eminence. Um, we really are um, coming to to the end of time. Let, let me just ask quickly if 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 anyone has something that they think, what should we be watching? What what should we be looking for? Um, e either with with respect to um, the you. Ukrainian bishops, perhaps, uh, under Moscow Patriarchate. Um, in, in other forms, people have been talking a lot about this. Uh, several of them are no longer commemorating uh, Kirill. Um, should we be watching um, the clergy in the Moscow Patriarchate, uh, in, in Russia proper? Um, what, what, what would you be looking for as a potential sign of hope, um, uh, a, a step forward? Um, uh, uh, Father Cyril. Yes, um, this is um, the war that really changed. Uh, it's, a, it's a game changer. It has changed a lot uh, already uh, in the church without us realizing this completely. Uh, and more things um, uh, 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 will happen in the future. I, I think one of the changes that has occurred that is that uh, people uh, on the ground Nowadays, they are people, you know, in the shelters, in the basements, hiding from the air strikes, uh, for hiding in uh, uh, against the bombardments. I know priests who were hiding literally in the shelter, shelters on the occupied territories, uh, afraid being afraid of their lives. Uh, so it's not just people on the ground. Sometimes it's people under the ground. Uh, they have now much more uh, powerful voice. And we need to, to listen to that voice of the ordinary people. Well, the time, I, I believe the time of statements is gone. Uh, who, 
Well, actually, who cares about statements in the time when people die? Yes, people who produce statements, they may believe that their statements are important. More important are, are the voices that, that come out of people who struggle to survive, literally, who don't know whether they will uh, live tomorrow or maybe they will die next moment. You know, those uh, words are much more sincere. They, they, they matter much, much more than the official statements produced, you know, in the security of the offices. That's what we need to pay attention to primarily. And I think that those voices are the driving force behind important changes within, within our tradition, within our church. Thank you. Thank you, Father Cyril. Anyone else with a, with a final comment or I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Maurice, who will wrap us up. Just say uh, one word. Yeah, you please, Father Daniel. Look for peace and for those who are speaking about peace. And then we can talk about all other theories after when we can comfortably sit in offices, et cetera. And <laughs> peace. Thank you. Yeah, yes, um, maybe say just a few words. I think it's time of, of personal witness, of course, first uh, of all, from those who uh, suffer uh, during this uh, terrible war, but also personal witness uh, from uh, uh, all other parts of the world's, uh, world with the words of solidarity, uh, love and support. Maurice? I, I, I'm speechless. I think uh, unless His Eminence or yourself uh, have something to add to what uh, uh, Father Cyril, Father Daniel and Sergei have said, I think this is probably a, a time for, for you and I, George, to thank everyone who has, uh, well, first of all, to thank our panelists. We're extremely grateful that you made the time to be with us and to thank uh, participants. And um, as per the message that Emily put in the chat function, this will be available on YouTube, hopefully by Monday, on both Fordham, Uni uh, Fordham University's Christian Center, as well as uh, the Creed. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be on YouTube and it will be circulated to everyone who has joined today. Um, and feel free to circulate it to whoever you wish um, then. So um, thanks from me. And I think, George, over to you to close. Uh, just uh, a thank you to everyone, um, and uh, it, we've all been, we're we're in the first week of Lent, um, which it, itself, you, you know, it's um, I, I myself uh, I, I'm not a clergyman, so I, I don't have the quite the routine of services every day like like the rest of you, but it, it's almost jarring. I, I say, oh yeah, it's Lent, <laughs> it's Lent, right? And and may, and maybe that's precisely what we need. Um, so with that, um, uh, we, we thank uh, our participants, um, uh, especially your eminence. I, I, I know you've been pulled in like a, a hundred different things, um, and, and so we re really appreciate uh, your time for joining us. Uh, we wish everyone well, um, and all of our prayers to everyone suffering. Thank you. <laughs>